Hello, Daniel. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. I saw your article a few weeks ago and it really piqued my interest um, for a number of reasons. I think the whole topic uh, that we're talking about here of secret histories is fascinating. But there were a particular couple of things that really captured my attention. One was this um, comparison made between, I guess you could say, um, sort of spiritual experiences, um, ways of talking about experiences in consciousness. And this comparison with music really captured my attention. I know that you were quoting uh, William Irwin Thompson. And then also something you said about, I think I may have captured the actual line. You said something about myth, which again, myth is something that is really close to my heart. And you said myth can reawaken our imaginative and intuitive faculties if we define a proper relationship to it. So for those reasons, I felt like it was really um wonderful thing for us to be able to dive in and have another conversation um the last conversation we went really deep into into I guess you could say kind of like psychedelic phenomena um and so this feels again like a really juicy conversation to enter into so based on that kind of quite a wide array of topics I'm wondering where to start and I'm wondering actually this might seem a quite a basic place to start but I'm wondering if you could define what you mean by secret histories. Uh, yeah, well, you know, thanks for having me on again. Yeah, I mean, it's 7 a.m. here, so I have to admit I'm, I'm still waking up. So my brain is like, you know, filing, firing on just like two cylinders at the moment. Hopefully it'll warm up to like three or something or four. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, well, I mean, you know, the, the genesis of the course, I mean, something I've been thinking about for a couple of years now, actually, or wanting to do this. And um feels like generally there's been a huge amount of focus over the last 10 or 20 years in, you know, psychedelics, then indigenous cultures and shamanism, ayahuasca shamanism, you know, huge interest for the last decades into kind of Eastern mysticism, yoga, meditation, Buddhism, uh, but much less interest from, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, kind of like the, the new consciousness crowd in, into our own you know, Anglo-European um, hermetic and esoteric tradition. Mm. And um, I think there are, you know, a number of reasons for that. We're still kind of like in the hangover of um, that tradition having been stopped on so brutally over so many centuries. Uh, and there was like a series of, you know, times where there were kind of efforts to either you know, bring back, uh, restore kind of like an initiatory esoteric knowledge um, or to just continue perpetuate what was, you know, known from the past. And uh, as Christianity took hold uh, and then as science took hold, uh, those efforts were kind of like stomped out. Uh, so going back to like, you know, the third, fourth century, you had the Gnostics. I mean, early Christianity was kind of like this ferment of, um, you know, different ideas around what Christ meant. If you read like the mm. comedy uh, Gnostic Gospels, which we just found in like a cave in Saudi Arabia in like 1945 or something, it shows that there was like this incredible kind of open, there wasn't like a set canon of like, this is this is the only things you can believe. It was like very, you know, there were things that were very neo neoplatonist, you know, very uh, mystical. You know, the focus was much more on, uh, you know, in, inner experience, self-knowledge, realization, mm. in the door for yourself, you know, as, as Christ says in the Gospel of Thomas. And then as the church... Uh, Alchemy, um, really. What's that? Alchemy, in a way. Well, yeah, I mean, well, you know, that's that's a whole other, I mean, you know, there's a few different strains in the secret histories, you know, you know there's the, the sort of Gnostic, Neoplatonic, um, but then there's also the sort of alchemical uh, thing, which, you know, is kind of like a, I mean, I've been discovering is kind of like a worldwide phenomenon. Like China had its school of alchemy in India and so on, uh, and the Arab world did. And then it sort of, you know, take, became a new center in the West uh, in the Middle Ages up to the Renaissance. Uh, and then at a certain point, um, no, it was funny. So you had um, this uh, stomping out of the Gnostics in the fourth century AD with like 
the famous uh, murder of Hypatia in Alexandria. She was like the leader of the Gnostics and the Christian monks like stoned her to death or something. Uh, and then you had um, early Renaissance uh, when, when uh, sort of there was the dark ages in a way, like we lost a lot of the knowledge and it actually was preserved in the uh, Arab world. Um, and then as that world began to collapse, scholars began to bring like hermetic books back to the West. And those were translated in the early Renaissance. And that led to the sort of hermetic Kabbalistic uh, Renaissance uh, led by people like Piero, uh, also uh, Ficino and, and um, particularly Pier, uh, Della Mirin Mirandola. Um, and, uh, but they like, they also, you know, encountered resistance um, and then um, and then there was this uh, Rosicrucian movement uh, in the uh, 16th century, sorry, 17th century. Um, they issued these three manifestos in like the beginning of the 17th century. And then that was seen as a threat to the establishment in the church. And so that, that was forced underground. And, you know, some of that energy resurfaced in secret societies like Freemasonry and so on, um, which became more of a as, you know, as is the whole strange phenomenon that I haven't gotten to yet. But, but anyway, so yeah, so um, so those are, I guess, the when you ask the secret histories, it's this kind of like um, kind of effort to restore kind of a initiatory uh, esoteric uh, knowledge going back to, you know, ancient Greece and Egypt or whatever uh, mm -hmm. practices. Uh, I mean, somebody who I've just been discovering um, is this guy Cornelius Agrippa. Who wrote three books of occult philosophy in the sixteenth um, century, and they're amazing. Like they're just, um, but he was sort of um, considered a black magician. I just thought he was going to be an old fuddy duddy, uh, but it turns out that he's incredibly advanced. He was like very much like for the rights of women. He believed that you know women were completely equal to men, uh, and um, his writing is just brilliant and extraordinary. Uh, and I, I love when that happens, when you have an idea about, mm. like, uh, so then you start to actually discover their work, and you realize they were just very uh, alive and vital, and 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 that that's why they've they've maintained relevance in a way. Yeah. Oh, you're doing really well on a couple of cylinders, by the way. <laughs> that was a, a great introduction. Yeah. So I guess a couple of things are occurring to me, and you touched on this. Why do you feel there has been this... Um, real focus on us moving to understand um other cultures uh, you know forms of spiritual uh, spirituality and magic but much less so the secret history of this part of the world um and then the, there's a kind of follow-up question is like why do you feel that like now is the time for us to be talking about this to focus on this uh, okay so i mean um I think there were just many historical factors. I mean, um, I really liked um, this uh, this guy, Wooder Honegraaff, wrote a book on the Hermetic Tradition Guide, the Guide for the Perplexed. And he talks about how uh, Western esotericism is kind of like the rejected dustbin of the um, academy in the West. So all, all of that knowledge mm. very much like cast away, considered ridiculed. It was like it was like the other that was... I mean, I, I experienced the same things with psychedelics 25 years ago when I was writing my first book, Breaking Open the Head. Uh, at that point, if you talk, tried to talk about psychedelics with people in polite company, they would laugh at you um, or mock you or whatever. And there was like fear. Like I felt like when the book came out, I was going to be like, you know, tracked by the by the, inter the police or something or whatever. So, um, and now that suppressed energy of the, of the psychedelic, um, you know, kind of um, gnosis is, you know, moving through the culture in all these different ways. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, yeah, so, um, so I feel like there was that leftover sense of there's something being so tawdry about the Western occult tradition. I think if you like Crowley, yeah. uh, who just seems kind of very imbalanced, it's like fun if you're like a black metal, you know, sort of a, you know, heavy metal bands or like Led Zeppelin or something, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really seem like something serious for serious people. Mm. Uh, and so it just has this sort of weird hangover. And then it's true, you know, then like a lot of people who do get involved in sort of magical circles, you know, like the, the Wiccan people, it's like very like, 
you know, kind of like hippie. It, ha it hasn't felt it hasn't felt very grounded and very serious. Um, so, um, so I think that's part of it. And yeah, yeah you're that, quite and, right. That's that's so so well articulated. I think there's um, tawdry is a really good word for it, but also that kind of sense of like it just being nonsense. You know, the even though. Yeah kind of back in the day when this was all alive it was actually seen as the kind of height I, can't, I had someone on the show William Whitecloud talking about this recently and it's like that was actually the kind of height of academia the height of intellectual thought in the, that era it's and pre Descartes yeah, it's become now like this complete nonsense like if you had a brain cell why on earth would you even be interested in this yeah, exa ex exactly. Um, and also, yeah, and, and, and somehow um, there's a kind of mushiness to how the new age has glommed onto it. Uh, mm. Like kind of books that are published, uh, a lot of them, there's, there's just a kind of like, you know, oh, you know, it's like people who've, you know, flipped it over and instead of accepting nothing but, you know, strong material and rational evidence, have kind of decided to accept everything. Uh, and so like, yeah, if you look at the occult sections of bookstores or whatever, there's like, there's a kind of the kind of new age kind of mushiness to a lot of it. Mm. Um, right, right. So, but I think that, um, we actually desperately need a kind of rigorous and sort of, a rational and a more like full sense approach to our own esoteric uh, tradition. I think it would be extremely healing for our society and it's really necessary. Um, and the more I'm looking into it, you know, and I'm still, I mean, even though I'm doing the course, I'm still catching up and I'm still feeling like, you know, although I checked out a bunch of stuff, I, I have a lot to learn. It's just like a brilliant, like, like philosophical tradition, like whether you're going to look at the Corpus Hermeticum or, um, you know, these sort of uh, Neoplatonists uh, like Plotinus or Ian Blucus, however you pronounce his name, uh, and then Agrippa and Jonathan D. Um, mm. you know, even their errors are kind of wonderful in a weird way. Um, so, you know, it, use like if you go to, um, and then Rudolf Steiner, I mean, you know, so I'm right now I'm preparing for the first class, I've been thinking much more about the discussions. Uh, but then when you get up to like, you know, Gurdjieff and Rudolf Steiner and even Julia Savola, uh, who was an Italian um, the traditionalist, and Rene Guinan, kind of, I don't know if you know about like, the traditionalist movement in the 20th century, a lot of them were very like right wing. Uh, but they're very brilliant um, intellectuals, also. Um, so yeah, I mean, like I was, I've, I've, you know, for many, many years, I, I have this memory of going to uh, Dharamsala, which is the Tibetan Buddhist headquarters in uh, in India, in the mountains of the Himalayas. And one of the things that goes on there is the monks are in the courtyard, very um, kind of um, vibrantly debating uh, the Dharma. And different like fine points in you know Nisargadatta or whatever texts or whatever, and they'll make a point. Then they'll go like ha. Ah. Then the other one will you know make another point, and he'll go like ha. Ah. But but you know what we don't realize is that you know you know Hindu Tibetan Buddhism is not a faith. It's in a practical dialectical thinking, reasoning, uh, taken to a very profound level. Uh, but but I mm. as, and as much as I love Buddhism and think that it's incredible, uh, I actually don't think that it's completely appropriate for uh, appropriate. I mean, some people can go there, but I, I think that we have our own kind of dharma and karma as uh, Anglo-European Westerners that we need to sort of wrestle with. And for us just to kind of abandon that, you know, wholeheartedly and go into the Eastern thing, I don't think is quite right. And and I think you know we have like. Um, Kind of more interest in the material world, the material universe, and more of a sense of uh, interest in kind of um, an evolutionary process that is happening not just in the physical plane, but even in the sort of the esoteric, you know, mystical cosmological planes, uh, mm. which is not so much a consideration for Buddhism or for Hinduism. You know, they see this sort of cycles or they see that um, the goal of uh, spiritual, uh, you know, the spiritual quest is nirvana, uh, enlightenment, which is kind of like an, an annihilation of, of, of self. It's almost like the Western idea is more of an exaltation of self. Mm. Where the self in 
become united in a way. Yes, uh, absolutely. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, so the Corpus Medicum talks about like if you want to, you know, know God, you have to think like God. You have to understand how God understands. You have to be, you know, identify with everything and and see yourself as everything. So I and you know, and Tibetan Buddhism doesn't even have this idea of the all or the one or the sort of single principle or what we call God or whatever. Um, so yeah, I think that it's like we're at a crucial point. Um, and talking to you about it, even getting more excited about it, where like you know, we we have to step up our game and you know, use our intellectual and rational faculties, our you know, intelligence, our noose, divine noose. That was like a big concept of the Gnostics to actually, you know, grapple with our own history and our own tradition. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, one reason that we have to do that, because I think that was part of your initial question, was that, um, you know, we're part of this culture that's kind of like run, you know, ra- what's the right word? Ramshackle? No, that's the right word. R- run rampant, I guess, over the world, right? Like we've um, created this industrial mono, mono, monocultural technoculture that's now like everywhere, and we've created the systems that have basically blown apart the balance with the ecosystems to the point where we're facing potential extinction. And at the same time, our technology is actually pursuing rapidly those very goals of uh, the alchemists um, and actually coming close to achieving them. I'm very fascinated. Um, and I wrote in the in my book, Quetzalcoatl Returns, about uh, Ray Kurzweil, uh, who's a Google engineer, what a book called The Singularity is Near. Um, mm-hmm. And he basically argued that in the future, not only would we have kind of AI, you know, connected to our, you know, brains so that we would be able to think, you know, at that level, uh, but that also we would have basically, you know, achieved physical immortality, like our bodies would basically not age. And Kurzweil is now saying that that is going to be the case by 2030. Uh, that as the AI becomes super intelligent, it's going to um, meld with like nanotechnology and biotechnology and protein science, and they will basically be able to stop uh, aging. Um, and reverse it to a certain extent, you know. Mm. So I mean, that was like the philosopher's stone was was a, was you know partially the quest for the uh, elixir of immortality. Mm. Oh, I see. Yeah. So it is. Yeah, and like it also was this idea of this this sort of um, I mean the silicon is a kind of uh, I just looked it up yesterday. It's like in between a metal and a stone, uh, so it's like it's like our wow. and now created this kind of homunculi of this mm. technology. We can actually now speak uh, to our uh, projection of the internet and have it speak back to us uh, through these chatbots. So I, I feel that we're actually engaged in some kind of like tra- you know sort of alchemical transmutation is actually happening and we need to not just have a rational lens on it but also have a um esoteric lens on it mm. so. my goodness there's so much in what you've just said that's um join dots that um i hadn't even realized i hadn't been joined there was um a couple of things that you said there that really have allowed me to see why you described you use the word healing which i thought was really interesting like this reclamation of our lens on you know spiritual magical things is healing and it really stood out to me you mentioned steiner and i've noticed that even even parents who sent their children to steiner schools and know a fair bit about steiner don't actually know about this about him they're like completely unaware of his like, you know, magical interests, let's say, which I find fascinating. Um, you know, I don't think that's happened by accident. I think that was, you know, a cho- choice to keep that to some extent secret. And I was also thinking about when you're talking about how we've had this kind of like we've run rampant and sort of created this sort of, um, you know, monoculture. And I've been thinking a lot recently about biodiversity and I was thinking this is part of that biodiversity, uh, this reclamation of this part of the world's um, spiritual tradition is part of the the Earth's biodiversity. It's like a necessary part. It's a part of creating that kind of it all working together and being right for the particular location, a particular type of people. Um, that's something I've not seen before, um, but it really suddenly has just made complete sense. Does that make sense? What I've just said. 
Yeah, it does. I, I guess I'm seeing a little bit of a, um, you know, on some level, a bit of a retraction from that because, you know, once again, if we look at our culture, Anglo-European, uh, you know, um, colonialism and imperialism and post-enlightenment, um, you know, we've been responsible for, you know, reducing not just biodiversity, but cultural diversity mm. to, to an, uh, you know, horrific extreme and it's ongoing. Um, you know, like I, I, I used to work with this uh, indigenous uh, group called the Sequoia in Ecuador. And by the time, you know, there was like 30,000 of them in 1900. By the time I visited them in like 2000, there was like 750 of them left. And there was like a handful of elder shamans. And now like, you know, basically the last of the elder shamans have just died in the last couple of years. And, that, and none of the kids, the kids are now like working in mining towns or getting sucked into trying to get like, you know, sneakers or whatever. So it's like that, that whole precious culture, you know, basically has, has, has is getting lost or, you know, and that, that's happened all over the world. So all of these. So, um, yeah, I mean, but I, I think it's that, um, you know, but, but, but a lot of our imposition of um, this monoculture came from first this sort of Christian hubris and then this technological hubris, you know, the sense that we're just, you know, because we're smarter than, every, than everybody else and we've, we're, you know, faster creating these industrial machines, we somehow have like the right to impose, you know, kind of our will on, on the planet as a whole. Um, so hopefully if we were to make a, you know, what I'm really talking about here is like, is like a kind of underlying shift in worldview or paradigm. Mm. Um, from the uh, reductive mechanism, uh, the, the you know scientific rationalism, which has been dominant until now, to a different perspective, which um, you know, I mean, I wrote about in my past books, but over the last years, one of the best um, kind of um, you know kind of uh, uh, expressions of this uh, has been through this work of the philosopher Bernardo Castro, mm -hmm. who, who calls himself an analytic idealist. And uh, he was a he was a scientist. He was a computer scientist working at CERN, and he began to realize that, um, you know, from even from what he was studying at that point with artificial intelligence and computers, that we actually, for him, it suddenly became clear that we live in a mind before matter universe. Um, and this idea that um, you know, mind is an epiphenomenon of matter, and consciousness is just an accident of biological evolution was the wrong way to look at things. And that actually, it seems you know more and more clear that it's more like consciousness is the fundamental reality. Like everything is an experience within consciousness, um, mm. and this is why scientists can't, you know, even rational science can't deal with the hard problem of consciousness and of kind of like you know can't really get anywhere with that. So if you flip it around, then everything makes perfect sense. Like the mm -hmm. physics discoveries, the the realization that you know the the universe is not locally real. Uh, which is what won the uh, physics prize in, in 22. Um, you know, the discoveries of the observer and the observed being connected, you know, non quantum non-locality, you know, all, all of this is just happening within consciousness. And we're just, you know, temporarily dissociated aspects or projections of this unified field of consciousness. Uh, and from that perspective, then all of the hermetic philosophy, the um, kind of... Um, esoteric wisdom traditions also make perfect sense like um mm. you know we can't if, if everything is like a giant consciousness experiencing itself then it is also like a, a giant dream and just as there are symbols in a dream that have meaning we can look at you know the bird that's having that's nesting in my window you know is um you know could be seen as a symbol of something of domesticity or whatever mm. we can we have the we then have the right to you know look at the world as you know, occultists did in the Renaissance, or as children do innately, that it's a it's a symbolic world that's always speaking to us. You know, and there are, you know, potentially um, divine intelligences um, and elemental intelligences. You know, behind the, the you know the the visible expressions of of, of the physical world. Mm. Yeah, I love everything you just said, and I love what you also said about the. the effects of that monoculture that has kind of taken over everything and is is literally killing people and animals and parts of the world um what was just coming to mind was um my 
my own uh, shamanic lineage is British, but we have very strong links with the Wiracuta um, indigenous people and indigenous shamans in Mexico. And so much of my own kind of focus and passion and work is that reclamation of British shamanism. Like, what does that mean when it's applied to this land, this location? And as I was pondering, as you were talking, I was kind of like thinking about different things you're talking about. And also this kind of the bigger view of what we're talking about here about consciousness. Um, I was interviewing someone a few weeks ago and he said something that really had me kind of like stop and think. And it, it, it makes sense to me. I'd be interested to see what you think. He said something like the kind of not just original, but almost like the default, the natural human worldview is animist. It's like that we know that's kind of like, you know, with whatever culture we look at, there's some form of animist worldview, but it's more than just the original worldview. It's actually kind of like the natural worldview of humans is to see reality in that way, to see, to experience the world in, in that way. And there was, I feel that we've lost, again, going back to why this is healing, it's like we've lost our own lens on that, our own um, way back to that view, whether you call it animist or anything else, it's like oh, fundamentally we're talking about the same thing, this kind of um, lens on consciousness, which then led me to, let me just uh, pause and uh what was what was coming back is the the quote you talked about about music how all these different traditions all across time across cultures are talking about similar phenomena in different ways and so i'm not quite sure exactly what the question is but i would love you I'd love you to say more for listeners who haven't read your article why is that particular quote where you likened and i, I know you were paraphrasing or quoting someone else saying it why do you think that's important and relevant? Like, how is that helpful to to know that? Which part is relevant? Which part? Why is which part relevant? The uh, the I'll uh, I'll the music quote. The quote from passages about Earth by William Irwin Thompson. Yeah, yeah that well, part I, about. I, I wanted to mention for anybody listening that uh, they can sign up for my newsletter uh, where I write about this stuff all the time. DanielPinchbeck.substack.com. Uh, and also they can check out this course, which is coming up at, at liminal.news, um, which starts on Sunday at 1 p.m. EST and runs for six uh, six Sundays. Um, so William Irwin Thompson, I think, is like brilliant, wonderful mind. He's, he's not really known anymore as well as he, I think he passed away a number of years ago, a few years ago. Uh, but yeah, so he has all sorts of incredible thought streams. But um that still seemed very uh, important to me, actually, in terms of understanding our contemporary situation. But it, you know, what, one thing when I was when I got uh, so basically, what happened to me is I wrote "Breaking Open the Head," and I had um, kind of supernatural, psychic, occult experiences, synchronicities, and all that stuff. And I I came from a secular materialist background, so I didn't really even think that those kind of things were possible. Um, but then they happened to me, and then I, you know, talked to a lot of other people that had similar things and read, you know, lots of accounts, um, like, you know, Carl Jung's autobiography, like, you know, it's kind of stuff that happens to all sorts of people. Uh, so I had to then, you know, go through a shift in worldview. And some of the things that happened to me were a little bit dark, like, um, like I trespassed into like occult worlds, you know, through psychedelics, uh, when I wasn't really invited, there was like, you know, kind of retribution in a way. Um, so, um, I started looking around for a way of understanding all this stuff. And so I started reading like Carlos Castaneda, got me really depressed because it's a, his is a very dark, like ev everything is out to get you in the uh, astral world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, was yeah. probably, uh, I was sort of lost. Then, then a friend turned me on to Rudolf Steiner and that was like incredibly centering for me. Like, I think Steiner is one of the great, um, Kind of continuers of the of the you know ancient tradition, the mystery school wisdom. Uh, but what I noticed as I was reading all these different occult kind of uh, ideas and channel texts and all that stuff, you know, they, a lot of them would would have like um, a way of talking about you know these other worlds and these beings and how they affect us. But they were always like slightly like off register from each other, 
And, and I was like, it just felt very confusing. So, you know, Thompson's idea was that um, the different occult cosmologies are like, um, like listening to different composers, you know, play different music. So that there's like a similarity between like Bach and Beethoven and, you know, Strindberg or whatever, but there's also uh, Strindberg, Strindberg's not right. Well, Bach, Beethoven, you know what I'm saying. Um, mm -hmm. that, but there's also a difference, you know, and I, I think that makes sense because what we're talking about is actually beyond language. Like, you know, our, our, our language is um, a tool that we've developed, you know, evolutionarily to deal with things that happen in the material world. And, um, you know, particularly in our Western languages, it, it's highly dualistic and has a lot of um, baggage uh, mm -hmm. built in, like, you know, like, um, like, I think there are other languages, like indigenous languages, which, which actually are much more, uh, would be much more helpful for us and how they, you know, how there's a kind of phenomenology built into their uh, mm. language. Like, if you read, like, uh, Benjamin Worf, who wrote a lot about the Hopi language, and how the Hopi don't even think about, like, past, present, and future as, as we do. They think about more of, like, a subjective and an objective uh, uh, kind of dimension where, like, there's like an emergence of things from the from the subjective from potentiality and into manifestation or whatever um which really accords very nicely with quantum physics maybe better than our kind of linear understanding of, of time's mm. past so um yeah so so um uh William Owen Thompson's idea of the of the different occult cosmologies being like different types of you know, compositions, you know, musical tonalities gave me a, another access point for, for understanding, you know, something. I mean, and, you know, some of them are truly, you know, seem truly batshit crazy. Like if you try to read Plato's Timaeus now, you know, most of it just feels incoherent, like, you know, that, that they were trying to, like, they were so desperate to think they could understand things without really measuring or knowing anything that it was, like, all over the place. Um, mm. A really nice book that I just read is The uh, Secret History of the World by Martin Booth. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a very interesting effort to kind of, uh, I mean, it was very, it's, I would say Rudolf Steiner was one of the main um, kind of uh, sources for it, but he was sort of trying to present this idea of the ancient mystery school wisdom and its understanding of these sort of, you know, larger cosmic cycles and humanity's passage from more like a vegetative state to an animal state to our present state to maybe future more, you know, immaterial conditions or different forms of substantive you know, conditions um, in, in accordance with, you know, what he, he believes to be kind of like this, you know, perennial philosophy, this kind of underlying, you know, understanding you know mm. it's such a good point uh you were making about um this is me really paraphrasing but it's like our language um is a product of our cosmology and right now you know certainly here we don't have a cosmology that allows for us to talk about these things in any way that um yeah well or i'm saying maybe a little bit the opposite the cosmology is a product of the language you know, I mean, they, they, they form together, like, you know, I mean, you know, like, why is Shakespeare such an amazing writer? Uh, partially, it's because we didn't have, you know, dictionaries or copyrights back then, you know, so he could play with language, he had a freedom to invent words or to sort of like choose, I mean, even his name was spelled like 13 times, you know, 13 different ways during his life. Mm. So, um, so th and that suggests how, how different their sense of self and identity was, you know, e even in the Renaissance. Uh, and then mm, yes it's like forming it's emergent yeah it, it's mm. it, there's it's more spacious and, and, and now we like um increasingly kind of like over defined and like over rigid rigidified our structure or, or you know and our, and our language uh around around reality so mm. it, i guess i think we have to consciously um you know deconstruct some of that you know again yeah mm. uh, another thing i wanted to say just before i forget uh before is um yeah i mean i think animism is you know still a very powerful and very natural way of thinking about you know reality it's certainly one way of thinking about it i mean what i've seen what i've been seeing happening in the in the psychedelic movement as it's co-opted by um corporations and by the sort of uh, psychology establishment is they're putting everything 
into a uh, psychological lens, which mm. which be focused on uh, the sort of therapeutic process for the individual. And yes. I really think it's super limiting. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's like another reason why I think, you know, like um, we need the uh, more capacious understanding that we get from studying like esoteric and hermetic philosophy. Because there are a lot of experiences that people will have on high dose psychedelics that really, you know, you can try to contort language and just use kind of this therapeutic language, but that's really not what's actually happening. Mm. And, and, and I language is so powerful that we're actually going to um, try to sort of too quickly, uh, you know, I think it's already happened, actually close down on the meaning of the psychedelic experience and have put it into kind of uh, the materialist frame in a way. Uh, oh, I absolutely agree. Funnily enough, I was um, looking at some research earlier that was... Uh, the question I was pondering um, and I was looking to see what has been said out there is about how the way that um, psychedelic experiences often sh show up in kind of, uh, you know, geome geometric shapes. And I was looking at kind of what had been written about that, what had been researched about that. And it was just completely from this, you know, lens that was re so reducing it to what we can already make sense of and know which I suppose is obvious, but it was just mind blowing. It's like, it feels like there isn't even the curiosity to wonder what, what might be beyond what we already know. Um, so we're um, coming up on time and I'd love to, before we close, explore that again, that line that really caught my eye in your uh, post, which was, Myth can reawaken our imaginative and intuitive faculties if we define a proper relationship to it. Um, so you don't have to directly um, expand on that, but really just this idea of um, how we can relate to, speak about, um, allow this idea of myth to live through us in a way that is generative is healing is um opening us into something else yeah i mean um well i i guess part of my perspective which was shaped um, a little bit by uh, some of nietzsche's ideas and, and also by uh, this fantastic uh, english writer who's like one of my big uh, intellectual heroes this guy patrick harper have you looked at him at all no i don't think i have uh, you should totally look him up, read his books, and interview him. He he deserves like a million times more attention. Mm -hmm. uh, a book called The Philosopher's Secret Fire, uh, and actually I published one of his books years ago called The Secret Tradition of the Soul, uh, and it's absolutely fantastic. Um, but anyway, this this idea that ba basically as as humans we live and we and we think mythologically. Uh, even even when you know we've imagined ourselves as rational, so like the, you know the the uh, the Big Bang, is is a mythological structure. You know, um, this idea of you know the 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 heroic, rational scientist. You know, is, is a myth. You know that we that we're kind of living. Mm. Um, so yeah, if you you need to sort of start backing up and understanding that we're always living you know mythologically mm. um, and um i mean harper does a really great job of, of ex exploring that how how i mean um yeah like you know i mean some myths come true but like ray kurzweil um in the book the singularity is near uh says that in the future like we won't even have to like you know breathe because we'll have nanobots in our uh, lungs that'll process oxygen for us, uh, or, you know, uh, and if we want to um, experience like a different reality, the nanobots will, you know, create a sort of total virtual simulacra, sim like some other land or some other place or something. So in, in a way, the the nanobots are exactly like the, the fairies that you find in like ancient mm. myth, like in, or this like wish fulfilling jewel or something like that. So we're always kind of living in myth and we're sort of recapitulating myth. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, to become conscious of that uh, and then realize that, um, you know, there are, you know, more useful myths and, and less useful myths. And there are myths that give us a lot of space uh, to, um, you know, create 
things that are wonderful. And then there are stories that, um, you know, really, really close down our possibilities. Um, I guess that's part of what I was trying to put out there. Mm, I really love that. So coming on to your course that you're uh, just about to run, which I know is a kind of expansion and a continuation of this conversation, really. I'd love you to share more about it. Why, what, when? <laughs> yeah, well, I think I just shared a lot of the why, but I mean, um, mm. Um, I feel that we are on the cusp of a paradigm shift uh, and that, um, you know, moving from, you know, mechanistic materialism or reductive rationalism to something like analytic idealism or panpsychism is like the only way forward for humanity. And any movement like that starts with a small elite. And we have, a, you know, a large elite, you know, if you go to transformational festivals or, um, you know, different gatherings of people who've been exploring, you know, shamanism, spirituality, esoteric practices. But I don't feel as of yet there's been enough of a kind of um, sort of comprehensive intellectual engagement uh, mm. with, with what's going on. And um um, we need that. So otherwise we also fall prey to scammers, you know, or grifters. I mean, you know, you have people like, you know, Joe Dispenza, you know, a certain amount of what he says is great. And he's really, you know, I'm sure he's helped many, many people, but also I, I, I sense there's a kind of grifter element there. I mean, personally, uh, and a lot of these new age people, you know, the, you know, seem like they've, you know, it's a little bit manipulative because they've learned that if you say certain things and, mm. you know, when you can make a huge amount of money and, and have a huge following, um, you know, but I think that that's not going to get us to the next stage that we need to get to. We need to engage our, you know, you know, what the Gnostics called noose, you know, our, our, you know, divinely given, you know, reasoning faculties to, you know, really explore and understand um, the nature of reality from a number of different angles and, and, and perspectives. Uh, and then hopefully apply that knowledge too. I mean, through um, uh, like if we if you know if we were to attain a certain degree of certainty about um, the way these other worlds um, exist and interpenetrate with our world, then um, you know certain kinds of practices make sense again. Uh, mm. you know, like um, you know, like if you read Agrippa, he talks about how for the you know for the magician, like intention and belief are key elements in a magical process uh, working, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so, so you know, for reasons like this, I think that it's a great time to do this course. And then also we have kind of this strangely alchemical uh, sort of process happening with the technology, with artificial intelligence, which kind of seems like it's fulfilling the alchemical dream. Uh, whether it's like creating a sort of magical stone in the form of like our silicon technology, which can answer all of our questions, or even the possibility that we're creating a sort of elixir of immortality for real when, when biotechnology, artificial intelligence, and nanotechnology merge. Um, so, I mean, you know, at the same time, we are, you know, in a race against time with the, with the, with our effect on the biosphere, which is, you know, in the process of you know stripping you know away you know biodiversity and and leading to climate emergencies and you know causing massive price spikes you know I'm sure, I'm sure you're experiencing in England as as all mm. these like different um, problems like sort of coalesce and so on so yeah I feel like the only way forward is the Hermetic tradition right now like that's like what people need to get into. <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> really what do. Um, you know we're not gonna we need magic right now to like you know. You know, but but seriously, and not just like in a woo-woo kind of like new agey, like let's hold hands, you know, in 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 the you know Glastonbury, you know, well or something like that. Um, yeah. So. No, uh, I love that. And yeah, if you, mm -hmm. if you want to take the course, it's www.liminal.news uh, is my website. Um, I can, I'll also I'm willing to offer like discounts or scholarships. People are financially challenged. I really want people to have the access so they can email me on Facebook, um, you know, uh, and I'll, you know, work out something with them. Uh, and also I write a lot about this stuff in an ongoing fashion on my Substack. Also the course will be live on Sundays, but the, the recordings will be available. So you can watch them during the week. We're gonna have a discussion forum, which I think could also be very interesting if people get engaged to uh, share with each other. 
And um, yeah, maybe I'll rebroadcast the lectures during the week and then have another Q&A so that people who work can catch them. Uh, so that's the deal. That's what I'm doing. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, much needed. Uh, uh, that's a, a real great quote there. We need magic right now. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, thank you so much, Daniel. This has been fabulous. So this will, uh, well, it's out there live now. So if you are watching this now um, or in the next day or so, it's, it's Friday, the 21st of April now, and you're beginning uh, on the 23rd yes Sunday the 23rd um, and it may well be for some listeners they're listening to this uh, in the future on the podcast but I would still encourage them to go find out more about you and your work because I'm sure this is going to be you yeah, know continuing you. Mm, wonderful yeah. Yeah. thank you so much Leah thanks for having me thank you so much a real pleasure